My name is Bruce McCammon. I've been with Allison Transmission about 26 years. I work in the service department, not the marketing department, so I don't know any big words. You have to bring your own stuff, so here's my laser pointer from the service department. What I want to do this morning is take you through a five-day service training class in about 45 minutes. Anybody got a problem with that? It's kind of like school, you know, just give me the facts. So that's what we're going to do this morning. And uh, my expectations for you is to come away with about three or four things that you can either share with the customer or make decisions amongst yourselves is, you know, here's some inputs or outputs that you might think of, or why do we have six ranges versus why does a, a manual shift transmission have to have 10 or 12, something like that? What's the torque converter do for us? I don't know. Well, we're going to find out. And uh, so hopefully from the start of the 45 minutes to the end, uh, we'll kind of put that all in one package and hope it makes sense. So here we go. And we're not going to get any more complicated than this. <laughs> so you have an engine, transmission, and wheels. And an engine by itself, it may be a high-tech, multi-million dollar engine, but it's not very efficient to spin the wheels. You have to have something in the middle to transform that rotational force or torque into the usefulness so we can let the engine run at the sweet spot all day long. Basically, that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to talk about the manual, automated manual, and then, of course, the Allison transmissions. Told you I didn't know any big words. We have small, medium, and large. And of course, this transmission goes behind a smaller engine than that one. If you look at the cross sections, and we're going to dissect one of these, talk about some of the colors and what goes to what, um, they're easily assembled and disassembled. The 10 different colors represent chunks or modules that come out together. 20 years ago, I brought my 10-year-old son in here, and in a half an hour, giving him a 13, 15, and 18 millimeter socket, he had this transmission down with me helping pull some parts out into the 10 modules on the bench. It's easily assembled and disassembled. Now when you take your tour out here, it's interesting to see uh, how they assemble this. But what we're talking about is the customer is paying for his truck to be on the road, not in the shop, so that's kind of where we're going with this. All of our transmissions here are built with six forward ranges. Electronically, you may sell one with a five-speed, but what did you do? Basically, it's a calibration. You flip a switch and you make it a six-speed. But gut-wise or, or parts-wise, they're all six-speed transmissions with two overdrives. Being the service department, we enjoy getting transmissions in with two or five million miles out and looking at them. And uh, like when customers come in, they said, you know, hold your spiel, just tell me what's going to break first. Well, we'd say, you pay the guy in the transmission shop that puts transmission foot in there, and it'll last a long, long time. I would say, rule of thumb, the transmission is going to outlast the truck. Now, things that, that we see are really good as far as the design, all of our gears in the transmission are helical cut gear versus square cut gear. What I mean is that is it's cut at an angle. More surface area. I think of it as load-bearing walls in your basement. The more surface area you have between the pole and upstairs, the more force it can accept. That's what we're doing. Because we've got a lot of mating surface between the guys, we can accept a lot of uh, load coming in from the engine. The other thing is you'll notice that our specification as far as how big an engine can go behind these keeps getting kind of bigger and bigger. That's because we have serial communication interface now. J1939, the information computer three wire system. Now, talking about shift energy management, uh, when we shift like from our lower gears, we're burning some energy and that's taking some force. We can say, dear Mr. Engine, can you back off just a tad of a second while we make those lower shifts? And then we'll let you go back to full force, full power. So that's one of the reasons we can now have a bigger engine than we ever did before behind some of these transmissions. So helical cut gears is a great thing. We can accept more force coming in. The other thing is all the gears all the time are always in mesh. There's not one instance where we do this when we shift gears. So what don't we have? We don't have clashing of teeth. We don't have that wear factor. 
We would rather have a little excess iron maybe spinning around, but you're not wearing out the transmission. So between the helical cut gears and the gears all the time being in mesh, even the PTO gear is in mesh with the driven gear. It's got a hot shift PTO. So in other words, you can bring it on and bring it off. off. Basically, that's the output you're talking about. Okay. They said if I was going to have a class, I had to have a chart, and that's it. So rest assured. We want to look at the torque coming out of the engine and what happens to it when it gets to the transmissions. We will look at a, a manual and automated manual, then we'll look at the Allison transmission. Let's look at a manual shift transmission first. There's the shift points, there's the torque of the engine, road speed, that's when you shift come up, ramp up to speed, foot on the clutch, separate engine, transmission, put your gears in the right spot, take your foot off the clutch, put the power package back together. Look what we're doing to that multi-million dollar engine you just bought. Every time you put your foot in on the clutch, you're taking its force or your power away and you're having to ramp up. That's not a very efficient use of an engine. Plus, look where they're having to start every time. Down here, basically idle or maybe 850 pound feet of torque ramping up. Wouldn't it be nice to just stay up there all day long? Okay, let's look at an automated manual. Click. Basically the same picture. You may or may not have a clutch pedal there. Electronically, it's doing a little more, it's doing stuff down here, but the picture is going to look exactly the same. Now let's look at the Allison transmission. There's your sweet spot all day long. Every engine has basically got an RPM or torque it likes to run in. I'm a bicycle racer, and I've read all the books and all that stuff, and I found out that if I keep my pace at 90 RPMs, that's the most efficient use I can do that. If I get up to 120, that's not good, or 40, not good, but I can last, well, I'm old now, but I can last a long time at 90 RPM, and I just keep shifting gears to stay that. That's what we're doing with the transmission today to allow that engine to stay up there in the sweet spot all day. We talk about uninterrupted shifts. In other words, that driver, and we've got several different kind of drivers today, this guy can just mash his foot on the throttle and leave it all day long because we don't have a front end clutch. We don't have something that we can burn up if we make full power shifts with the, uh, like the manual shift transmission. So let's look at the torque converter. There's the torque converter. Got one in all the transmissions. It's in the front. I'm the engine. Through a series of flex plates, we bolt to the transmission. The purpose of the engine is to spin that torque converter. That's pretty simple. Now, let's see what it looks like inside. And we only have to remember two colors today. I'm going to even make it easier. You only have to remember one color. This side of the room, just like class, you only have to remember red. Anything you see in the transmission in red always spins with the engine. This side of the class, since you're in Indiana now, you're on our land, anything in yellow <laughs> spins with the turbine. Three parts of the torque converter. The torque converter pump, turbine, and stator. As you notice, the engine's out here. This is where you bolt on. There's the torque converter pump. It's always spinning with the engine. This turbine, notice the colors here? The turbine is independent. It's not connected in any way to the pump. It's the technical part. We're going to fling the transmission fluid because it's a hydraulic coupling. We fling the transmission fluid from this side to this side, try to get that to spin, spin the turbine shaft, spin our gears, and spin our wheels. So, if the turbine's not moving, the wheels aren't moving. Red, yeller. All right, it's going to be on the test. There is a hydraulic coupling. Think of it, this one, electric fan, this is plugged into the wall. No connection between this one and this one. We get enough air moving in there. Finally, we're going to overcome, in our case, the 60,000 pounds behind you and overcome that force and our turbine is going to move the wheels. That is a hydraulic coupling, and this is why we can make full power shifts, because we don't have a clutch to burn out. All we got is transmission fluid in there. We're going to talk about going up that hill this afternoon. 
it may be a little wet going up there, but your mission is to go up that 25% grade hill, stop halfway up, and then use your throttle and just go the rest of the way up. Our insurance companies won't even allow our manual or automated manuals to go up that hill, I think insurance purposes. Uh, we might start breaking drive lines, axles, that type of thing. But we used to have the train driver. These guys don't exist anymore. Who do we have? We got driver B, the guy that's going to try to drive it like a rental car. Do you remember when analog brakes first came out? I was at the airport, business trip, got in the rental car with my buddy, said analog brake equip. Well, we weren't even out of the parking lot. 60, 80 mile an hour down the exit, jamming on the brakes. Welcome to the drivers of today. So these are the guys that we have to design our transmission for. It's kind of like negatively designing. Preventing him from doing all the bad things. And we're going to talk about how the computer inhibits some of the things he's going to try. Okay. Figure before you go up the hill, better see what your shift selectors look like. Now, in the front row, you're responsible for where I leave this thing. It's your only job here to think. All right. On the 3000 and 4000 series transmission, we have either a lever, push button, or if you had a garbage packer, you might have both. On the 1000, 2000, OEM supplied, cable driven, no two digit display like we've got over here. And the only way the computer knows what range you're in, through the cable, we're turning this selector shaft. That signal goes back to the computer. But on the 3000, 4000, these are dedicated, uh, talking back and forth to the computer, and we're going to go around the horn here and see everything it does. But my first trick question for the day, and as the teacher said, there are no wrong answers. There's wrong answers, aren't there? Which one do you think you've got more control over, the lever or the push button? I hear push button. Somebody say lever just to make my story come out here. Lever. Oh, lever. There are wrong answers, and those were wrong. As we say in Indiana, another Hoosier term, it's got the same wires coming out of the back. They're identical. So, it's a preference between the OEM and the customer. Some people like the lever, some people like the push button. Of course, this doesn't have a lever, so to get in the hold positions, you use the down arrow button. Same thing for our hold ranges. But other than that, they're dead on identical. So, thank you. <laughs> just going around the block as far as we've got in here six different modes and to get to these different modes up and down arrow buttons toggles you around on the lever selector the Allison logo button gets you around okay first mode drive mode you've got two digits up there one says select one says monitor if this is set up as a six speed calibration wise you put it in drive, it's going to say six all day long unless you use our hold positions, and it'll say five, four, three. The one on the right is monitor, and what that means is what range are you in now? So me being a truck driver, I like to hear or know what range I'm in when I'm doing work. So as you start to upship, the number gets bigger. Now, we'll talk about that wrench in the middle, and that has to do with the prognostics, and that will identify when you need attention to those three parts on the right which is an option, we'll get there. Okay, so we all know what the drive mode looks like. Diagnostic mode, now you can read out your own troubleshooting codes. Then we've got the oil level sensor. On the 3000 and 4000, here's the control module, or I call it the pan that sits on the bottom of the transmission. The 4000 is just a little bigger. This smokestack right there is your oil level sensor. Oil level is about there. This is like a float in your toilet electronically. The official terms is it's got a Hall effect switch on top and it's measuring the density of the oil and it's sending that appropriate voltage back to the computer and then it basically it's going to spell out LO1 which means you're low one quart or HI2 which means you're high two quarts and guess what the engineers figured up to put on the screen there if the oil level is okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So, this is dead on accurate, and because it's dead on accurate, we make you wait for it. So, you have to be up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, zero output shaft, low engine speed, in neutral, foot off the brake, or foot on the brake, and now we'll give you a reading. Somebody said, well, don't you have a dipstick anymore? Yeah, we give you a couple of stubs to weld off that 30 foot of dipstick tubing, 
But what's more accurate? And plus, once you get more than six foot horizontal travel, it's not very accurate anyway. You got oil lying in the line. So, for the convenience of the cab, for procrastinators like me that won't pop the hood of my Grand Prix to check the transmission fluid, that's the oil level sensor. Standard on the 3000, 4000. It's not available on the 1000, 2000. Okay, those are the big three modes on the, on the left. Now, the ones on the right in yellow, prognostics. Biggest word I know. The reason they've come up with this, and it's an option, it's in the computer or transmission TCM. It's an option that can be turned on and off. The reason we have it with synthetic fluid now, now we're going 300,000 miles sometimes without a transmission oil change. We need these three to see how we doing in between without just waiting for that 300,000 mile benchmark. So that's what we've got here. We're looking at oil life. 99% it's going to read out down to 1%. They're looking at the mathematical algorithms, the shift density, how many times have you shifted. It's calculating all that. It's going to give you a percentage 99% down to 1%. Once you get past 1%, it's going to throw a wrench in the middle. Next mode is filter life. We know the pressure going in, oil pressure going in. We know the pressure going out. If that figure value gets too big, and you're going to get a wrench in the middle. So we've taken care of the oil life, filter life. And then the third one is clutch life. We've got five clutches in the transmission. And uh, we're looking at the wear. We know how much time it takes for that computer to tell that piston to push that on to get the new gear range. If that value gets too big, and we're also looking at it's a closed loop system between the clutch, the valve body, and the valve in there. It might be something in there. If any of those values get out of whack, we're going to throw a wrench in the middle. So prognostics, we would rather you use those values, what you see in the shift selector, other than that 300,000 mile benchmark that's in the manual. It's a more precise, keep you going, that way you can monitor it. In, okay. uh, in a Freightliner truck, the prognostics option or feature is available on uh, the 3000 and 4000 series transmissions but Freightliner has chosen not to re release it or make it available in, in uh, the 1000 2000 series so it's not an option in that product in a Freightliner truck some of your competitors do offer it in a 1000 2000 series now for the secret button the mode button it's nothing more than like a toggle switch, a convenient place to stick another input, something to flip on and off. That can be calibrated in the calibration. A lot of the time, the calibrate is performance versus economy. Or it might say PTO. You push that button and your PTO comes on. But a lot of times now, it won't have that economy performance. It'll be the computer is going to take over that decision whether the driver wants to be in performance. In other words, shifting against the governor or in economy getting about halfway up the power curve. The computer takes that over and now it makes the decision whether you should be in performance or economy. Uh, they've gotten some great results out of that LBSS load based shift scheduling. But I call that the mystery button because somehow the little sticker doesn't get on there a lot of time, whether it says PTO or uh, economy versus performance. Now, Let's see what this guy's going to try to do to your vehicle. Inhibits we're talking about now. 100 mile an hour down the road, it's all he knows, driver B, and he sees a corner coming up, bam, he drives it down into first gear going around the corner. Do you think it's going to go? No. Guy in the yellow shirt, he knew, he was going, won't happen. The reason is, we have speed sensors. We've got three speed sensors on the transmission, one in the front, middle, and rear of the transmission. The one on the front, sitting about a quarter of an inch away from these bumps, it's counting the bumps going around. So what do you think we're measuring? And don't say the bumps, that's the last class said that. What are we really measuring? This side, engine RPM. Then we've got one in the yeller, so we're really measuring turbine speed. So we're, it's really, we're looking at the combination or the, the difference between engine and turbine, so we're kind of seeing what the load is. Then we've got one on the output shaft. So between the 
input, the output, and everything in between. And the computer just said at that six to one downshift at that speed where we were, that isn't going to happen. So we prevented that until his road speed starts to decline. Then he will automatically shift to fifth, to fourth, to third, that type of thing. So we hosed him there. We inhibited him. Now, next thing he's going to try to do, 100 mile an hour down the road, and his buddy blows his doors off. Being a guy, that ain't going to happen. So what's he do? Sticks into R for race. And he'll do it too. Won't happen. Same principle. It's not going to go in reverse. Speed sensors, talking to the computer, not logical. And until his road speeds down to about a half a mile an hour, then it will shift into reverse. The next thing he's going to try to do, he's warming up the vehicle in the morning, in neutral, 1600 RPM, foot buried in the throttle, and he tries to pop it into drive. Won't go. That speed sensor's got a thing with the computer that says anything above 900 RPM engine speed, don't let it go into drive. So with these three inhibits, little funny stories we're talking about here, we just prevented things from going to a screeching start, a screeching stop, and from going backwards. So those are the big, the big three. Now we've got other, other things which we call electronic inputs and outputs. Each calibration has got about six or eight inputs and six or eight outputs that can either be wired in using hard wires or a lot of times today we've joined the 90s and they can be wired in through the J1939. Let's say you had a bucket truck. Bucket's up, outriggers are down, that guy's sitting in the passenger seat and Joe's up in the bucket. Well, you know what he's going to try to do, put it in drive. But we've wired in some inputs. That bucket has to be down against the switch, signal back to the computer. Outriggers up, signal back to the computer. Until those two things are satisfied, that truck's not moving. There's other examples of uh, inputs and outputs that are more than just inhibits. And uh, Dan's going to talk about some of those others like auto neutral and what are all the things that the guy in a garbage truck has to think about and do, you know, when he gets out. Does he have to put his foot on the brake? Does he have to hit neutral? Does he have to hit the, the high idle? And then he gets out. Our mission here, and uh, we always tell when we have customers come in, think up everything you want that truck to do. We do more than spin the output shaft. Maybe we can help reduce the time. Maybe he doesn't just have to put his foot on the service brake, hit the high idle. Maybe we've got some of our inputs and outputs we can use to cater to his needs. And that's very attractive when a lot of these non-user customers come in here. They say, oh, you can do that? Well, yeah. One other example of an input. Say you had a Jake brake, engine brake. Say they didn't have our output retarder but you wanted to help them out. Well, we'll take that wire coming out of the jake brake, that signal wire, and when we see the jake brake come on, we will downshift our transmission automatically into a predetermined range, get the engine RPMs up, makes the jake brake more efficient. So those are some of the inputs and outputs that not necessarily just inhibit, but help the guy do his work. Okay, your mission this afternoon, if you decide to accept it, is to go up our hill. We had to build that 25% hill because we don't have hills in central Indiana. Okay, we're going to talk about torque multiplication and why you don't need those big 14 to 1 gear reduction gears. Okay, picture this. You're sitting at the bottom of the hill, in gear, foot buried in the throttle, and it's that stage right before you've moved. We call that converter stall. So what's happening, there's your red part, there's your yellow part. We're going to fling the oil from this side to this side, but when your wheels are stopped, that turbine, the turbine shaft, the gears are all connected to the wheel, so that's not moving yet. So we're violently, when we send this oil over here, violently changing the direction of that oil going through that torque converter turbine, it's like cracking a whip. When you hear that sound cracking a whip, you're violently doing something. In this case, we're violently changing the direction of that oil, and then we send that transmission fluid through this stator. It's stopped, stationary. So the purpose of the stator is to redirect the flow of the oil back in the same direction as the torque converter pump to assist the pump. Okay, when this situation occurs, which we call converter stall, we're going to multiply the engine's torque, output torque, by two times. 
Here's the math problem for the day. Say you had a thousand pound feet of torque coming out of the engine at stall before you start moving up the hill. We're going to multiply the engine's torque by two times. First gear ratio is about a times four. So there's our 8,000 pound feet of torque where you started out at 1,000 pound feet of torque. And this doesn't even take into times three or four for your uh, axle ratio. So that's kind of the way it adds up. But there's where your bang for the buck is and why you don't have to have those granny gears. It's because we're doing the multiplying right here instead of waiting until you get in the gear train doing that 14 to 1. Now, you don't want to stay in this condition too long. You want to get moving down the road. So, once you've overcome that 60,000 pounds behind you, your turbine shaft starts to move because this is the only way to move the wheels. But we also don't have to burn that high-end energy all the time once you've got moving. So here's, here's where the brochure upstairs comes in and says, Allison transmission matches the power and the load. This is it. Once you start turning the wheels, the turbine's start turning. Now this transmission fluid coming over here has to hit a moving target. So it doesn't have that rigid stop surface. Torque multiplication is going to start to go down, but road speed goes up. We call that a thing of beauty around here. So we're not burning that high-end heat, and we're more efficient because we've got road speed momentum going down the road. Okay, Dan's going to talk a little more uh, later about uh, startability and the values on the right-hand side. What have you got at the wheels to get you going? Okay, there's only one thing wrong with my physics problem. Uh, in a hydraulic coupling, that can't quite go th the same speed as that due to energy inefficiencies, energy losses in there. Well, the engine manufacturer said, well, Allison Transmission said you were very efficient and we're not going to lose anything. Well, we're going to lose a little like that, but we came up with an answer. We invented the C-clamp. No, we invented, came up with a lockup. And when we do, this is going to occur somewhere when you upshift between second and third range, we're going to go into lockup and stay into lockup all the way up into sixth range. And then when you downshift somewhere between third and second range, we'll go back to that other picture where we can multiply the torque. So when we put this lockup clutch or the C-clamp on there, we got the same stuff over here as we do over here. And that's what we want. We don't have any spin losses inside there. Inside, we're going to add two components to the lockup or excuse me, to the torque converter, lock up clutch plate, it's in yellow, splined to the turbine, piston, splined onto the pump. What we're going to do is bring transmission fluid up from the sump through the center of that turbine shaft into, that, into this uh, piston cavity. Under pressure, push that piston against the clutch plate. Squeezing those two together is like squeezing those two together. That's how we bring on lock up hydraulically. Piece of cake, huh? And for you non-believers out there, <laughs> we have parts. That's red, that's yellow. We put hydraulic in the piston, press that against the clutch plate, the friction material. We also have dampener springs on here. So in other words, if we're being tied to the engine now, we don't want those nasty torsionals coming in from the engine. So these springs dampen or lessen the blow of any torsionals coming into the transmission system. Okay, so that's lockup. When's it come on? Approximately when you're upshifting between what two gears? Between second and third. Once you're in lockup, you don't have torque multiplication, but you don't need it because you've got momentum down the road. So you'll stay in a lockup all the way up into six, and somewhere between third and second range, you'll go back to what we call converter flow or torque multiplication. You gain one thing when you're in lockup. We also now have engine braking. If we're tied to the engine, it's a great way for engine braking. Something for everybody. All right, it's time to figure out how to get the right gears on. So the computer's got to make all these decisions on the left. Is he trying to do it a six to one downshift? Is the bucket up? What's my throttle? It's going to send its answer to the valve body in the bottom of the control module. We've got solenoids getting their answer. Basically, these are traffic cops pushing the valves up and down at a controlled rate. All right, and what we're trying to do is send our main pressure transmission foot to two clutches to control two gears to get the right gear ratio. 
We're either going to increase the torque or decrease the torque. We already talked about J1939. Not everything's hardwired these days. We've joined the 90s, and uh, more and more things we're putting on the J1939. It's a more sophisticated system that they even got priorities. So you have two signals coming into the computer at the same time. The, the computer makes the decision which one's more important. When do I need to get it first? Okay. Talk about planetary gears. We've got three sets of planetary gears in the transmission. They're labeled left to right, planetary one, two, and three. They've got three gears times three sets. So you've got nine gears for the engineers to try to figure out how to get six forward ranges. So our mission, using a hydraulic clutch uh, to rotate one gear, hold one gear, and our third gear, or the result, is going to be a different torque, whether we increase torque or decrease torque. There's our three sets of planetary gears. We have five clutches. We're, we'll talk about rotating clutches, C1 and C2 for clutch, and then three stationary clutches. So we're going to rotate a gear. We have to get rotation in, into the gear system from the turbine shaft. That's the only way we're going to kind of come through here or there. And then we've got three sets of uh, stationary clutches. Okay. First range. Hold a gear, drive a gear. The third member is my output. See how many times I have to rotate my input or engine input to get one revolution out of my output. One, two, three, four. So this is a four to one decrease in speed but it's a four to one increase in mechanical advantage or torque. So in our math problems at times four, that was first range. Then we talk about dropping a clutch and bringing on a clutch. Now we're gonna drive the ring gear, hold the sun gear. My result is still this carrier. It's still going slower than the input, but we're getting closer to one to one. By the time we get to fourth range in all of our transmissions, one to one. Input and output are the same. We just rotate two together. And the third one's got to go along for the ride at the same speed. To get reverse, hold the carrier. Doesn't matter whether the input is this one or that one. The other one's going to go backwards. That's how we get reverse out of here. To get overdrive, hold a gear, drive a gear, watch my blue sun gear. It's going a lot faster. My output's going a lot faster than my input. Absolutely no torque advantage here, but you're not pulling stumps out of the ground in fifth and sixth range either. Now, we talk about holding a clutch. We use stationary clutches, that C3 through 5. We pick one of those, hydraulic pressure from the valve body against the piston, squeeze clutch plates together. This pink piston we're pushing to the left, squeeze the clutch plates together. One set of the steel reactionary plates are splined into the case as an anchor. So whatever is being connected on the inside, when we squeeze them together, it's getting anchored to the case. So those are stationary clutches, and we've got three of them. Then we've got, like we said, we've got to get input in here. So coming down the turbine shaft, we're going to pick that rotating clutch or that rotating clutch. Same principle, clutch plates, a hub this time because we've got to drive something. So it's usually one rotating clutch on, one stationary clutch on, and that's how we're getting our gear ratio. Okay, you're just through day three of day five class. Smooth, huh? <laughs> just, we'll keep going. All right, for you that like to play it along at home, here's the X chart. The X's represent which clutches are on in which range. You notice that in neutral, we've got a clutch on. Whether we go to a forward range or reverse range, we're going to use that clutch, and we would rather not, as a quality thing, bring on two clutches at the same time to kind of take a dip in main pressure. So that's what we're doing. Okay, here's the eye chart for the day. Only one eye chart. We talk about a wide ratio versus a close ratio transmission. Maybe you've got an RDS unit, rugged duty, that's got that wider first gear than a close ratio, maybe a highway spatial or HS. Here's where it's happening right there. Highway spatial, maybe a, a close ratio, wide ratio, four and a half to one versus three and a half to one. I put this chart up here because some people in the past have said, oh, give me that, give me that four and a half to one because I know I'm going to get a deeper reverse. Look at this. 
All our reverses are about one to one, or excuse me, five to one. So your bang for the buck is up here, not here. As you can see in this chart, all our fourth ranges are one to one. So whether you have a wide ratio or close ratio, by the time you get to fourth range, they're all one to one anyway. Now, the only difference, somebody said, was well, it a whole different transmission? No, it's all in this last planetary. They make the sun gear bigger, planet gear smaller, and that gives you ratio difference between a wide ratio and a close ratio. Okay, in summary, a torque converter, it's a hydraulic coupling. It multiplies the torque in the lower range. Somewhere between second and third range, you go into lockup. When you do, you're tying the turbine and the pump together. Basically, we're tied to the engine now. You'll stay in a lockup up into sixth range, good engine braking. Somewhere between third and second range, you'll go back to the torque converter flow where you can multiply the torque. And then we've got three sets of planetary gears, five clutches. And that's how you're going to determine your mechanical ratio. Okay, done talking about gears, let's talk about buzzwords. PTOs, engine-driven PTO, converter-driven PTO, or turbine-driven PTO. The 3000 and 4000 series transmissions are engine-driven PTOs, which means, that's your responsibility over here, it's in red. So our torque converter pump drives the PTO gear through those tanks. The PTO gear drives the charging pump. Up here, no PTO, about four or five inches shorter, the, PT, or the uh, torque converter pump drives the charging pump with no PTO gear in. So, engine driven, whatever the engine speed is, that's your PTO speed. And if you're still wondering if you got a PTO unit on the truck, crawl underneath it. See if you've got this access door, two of them. If you do, you do, and if you don't have the access door, you don't have a PTO. Now that's a little different than our 1,000, 2,000. We didn't have the convenience of sticking four or five extra inches out here, so they had to put the PTO gear right up here in our rotating clutch module at turbine speed. You get the access door whether you have a PTO or not. Notice that's the only place that we can measure turbine speed, so we're measuring that PTO gear. If you bought a transmission without a PTO gear, how do you measure turbine speed? You have a tone wheel. So you either have a tone wheel or you have a PTO gear, but in any case, you got the access door there. On the 3000 and 4000, crawl underneath the truck, if you got the door, the access plate, you got a PTO. If you don't have one, you don't have a PTO. So that's kind of the difference. Engine driven versus con uh, converter driven or turbine driven. Now we also, say you had a stationary uh, condition where you wanted to run this transmission at engine speed. We have an option, neutral lockup. So now, flip the switch, neutral lockup, which means those two are tied together, the torque converter pump and turbine. Now your PTO gear is running at engine speed. Question? I was going to ask you what the difference is between converter and turbine speed. Uh, well, it's kind of a colloquialism. When we talk about converter driven, we're talking about turbine driven. Exactly the same thing. Except when we go into lockup, then the torque converter turbine and the engine are acting as one, and now you are at engine speed. So you, so when you're not in lockup, there is a difference between turbine and engine speed. So if you had a situation where you needed hydraulic, a hydraulic pump running off of a PTO in a 2000 series transmission that you were operating at low RPM, would you have enough converter speed to run that? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question just for the benefit of those that are watching the video. Um, the question is, if you had a, a high load running off the PTO, in this case your example is a hydraulic pump, do you have enough speed to operate that pump without neutral lockup at idle? And the answer is it depends on the load. The, the load on the PTO is no different than having a load on the output. If you get enough of a load, it will stall the turbine shaft, and it will take some amount of torque out of the, out of the engine to start the, the PTO moving. Depends on the load, how much that is. Um, 
The neutral lockup feature is set up so that you have to be above 900 RPM before neutral lockup can come on. And once you get to that point, then it's direct drive one to one and, and it will, as long as your PTO load does not exceed the limitations of the specs, you'll be in good shape. And it'll stay engaged in lockup until you get below 800 RPM. Uh, but, but, you know, as to what speed of the engine it takes to run the PTO, um, the doesn't... came up with landscapers that do a lot of cell fall work. Yeah. You know, they run a front, a front fall on them or a salter. Sander. Well, and that's a little bit different situation because now uh, when they're plowing, they're in gear. So it isn't the load on the PTO that's stalling the torque converter. It's the load of the PTO and the output of the transmission combined. And the issue there typically is, you know, regardless of what the load is, when you're at the end of a run, you're pushing snow, you get to the end of the run, it's time to raise the plow and move back. If the vehicle stopped and you're in gear, the PTO gear is not turning, period. So there is no, they can't raise the blade when they're stopped. That's, that's a, a, that's a, that's a, Matter of physics with a turbine driven or a converter driven PTO. There's no way around that. Did that answer the question? I know it, I know it doesn't, doesn't make it work any, any better or any different, but that, that's the, the physics of a turbine driven PTO. So they'd have to stop, put it in neutral to raise the blade up. In that scenario, you either that or start, start backing up, start and as you start backing up, the, the gear's going to start turning, then you raise it as you back up. Okay. That's why Dan here, he's the smart one. It's kind of like good cop, bad cop. <laughs> All right. Uh, last slide, and then I want to uh, build up the entire three sets of planetary gears for a 1,000, 2,000. I was talking about how easily it's assembled and disassembled. Well, I'll let you see it for yourself. But the last slide is adaptive control. This is kind of like the black box or the flight recorder in an airplane. The computer knows what your shift looked like, and if it didn't think it was perfect, the next time you make that shift, it's going to try to make it better and keep improving on that. So this is what we're going to talk about, and each uh, gear change, for the second to third, the third to fourth, upshifts, downshift, they've all kind of got a different looking picture inside the computer, but let's just pick the two to three upshift. Looking at turbine speed, or basically our load over time, and that's what the computer says is perfect. So we're coming along with our shift, one big, big engine flare flavor. So the computer said that probably was not perfect. The next time you make that same second to third uh, range uh, shift, I'm gonna try to make a big jump to get you down to that perfect shift point. It may take four or five big jumps or four or five times of you shifting from second to third range, but it's always trying to improve it. There's three specific cases uh, where this really comes in and uh, helps smooth this out. And while you're driving the trucks, you have a clue that this thing's even working. It just works. Okay, three different cases. You got 60,000 pounds behind you in a dump truck. You dump your load and you come back to the barn empty. It's going to drive a little different, a little load change than what you had before. The computer's going to smooth that out, try to smooth that out. Or let's say you had 10 million miles on those clutch plates, and it's taken a little more computer time to push those clutch plates together to hold that gear for your next range. It's going to try to speed up that time. Or your third case, my favorite, different drivers. You have driver A and you've got driver B, and we say they have different foot characteristics. Driver B's just hammering it, either on the throttle or off. So he's putting a kind of a different load or that turbine uh, parameter than driver A. But between full load, coming back to the barn empty, worn clutch components, different driver, that's what the adaptive control is for. Now, the reason we spend a lot of time in our service training classes teaching the technicians about that is if a guy brings a truck into the shop, says I got a bad two to three up ship, the, the service manager shouldn't say, well, tear it down, see what's wrong with it. No. What he should do is hand the guy the keys, tell him to go out and uh, play the radio, drive the truck, keep making that two to three upshift and see if it comes in and converges. If it gets smoother, we know that's the adaptive control uh, changing that for you. If it's not, then we go to the next step. 
So that's the adaptive control. It's like the black box or the flight recorder in an airplane. All right, the last thing, let's build up three sets of planetary gears in the transmission. This looks kind of intimidating when you come in the room. Why would you as a customer want all these gears? How easy is it to put it together? This is how easy. The engine's down there. This is the yellow, yellow turbine shaft, rotating clutch module, PTO gear, and the first sun gear of the three sets of planetary gears. We add to that planetary one ring gear. Here's your carrier of the first planetary in the middle, and here's the ring gear of the second planetary. Okay, throw in a bearing or two. Here's the second carrier and the, the ring gear for the third planetary. Now we're gonna add the blue shaft in there, which is the main shaft, and sun gear for planetary two and three. Now we've got the sun gear and the ring gear, so we're just missing the carrier. And on this one, we got a park pole. So on some of the 1,000, 2,000 units below 33,000 GVW, you physically put it in park, it physically puts it in park. Park brake. So there's our third carrier. And there is our three sets of planetary gears. And it's about that easy when it's guys tearing it down in the shop too. I'm in a clean room condition here. I'm not on my back if they're doing it still in the vehicle. But on our transmissions, we can load half the stuff from the front, half the stuff from the back. So if you got something back there that needs to be looked at, you don't have to take everything out the front to get to it. Easily accessible. So in recap, in our five day service training class, we talked about different drivers, we talked about the torque converter, that it multiplies the engine's force in the lower ranges. When you go into lockup, we're tying the uh, torque converter pump and the turbine together. Uh, three sets of planetary gears to get a different gear range. We're holding a gear, driving a gear, getting the different ratio. We've got a lot of electronics in here. Half of us to keep driver B from doing bad stuff. The other is to help kind of manicure or cater to the uh, customer to get the vehicle to do what it wants, and we provide more than just rotating the output shaft. Questions? Comments? Constructive criticism? <laughs> All right, well, thank you for your time, and this is Dan Murphy. Like I said, he's the smart one of the two. Mom raised him different, but she dresses us the same. Here's the thank you, Bruce. All right. Let's take this apart while we're... <laughs> Okay, as Bruce said, my name's Dan Murphy. I'm, uh, I've made my living from Allison Transmissions for uh, about 33 years. Um, I started out as a technician. Uh, all I worked on were Allison Transmissions for about 15 years before I came to Allison. I was in the service organization quality uh, for uh, a number of years and then the last five and a half years living the dream as OEM account manager with responsibility for the Daimler Trucks North America account. Um, the topics we're going to cover today are based on uh, myself and Joe Johansson. A lot of you guys I sure have worked with. He is an application engineer that works strictly with uh, Freightliner Trucks and Western Star. And we get calls from dealer sales guys, from our own field sales guys, from the Freightliner factory guys, CAE group, um, different questions. We kind of went through, you know, what are the things that are, are, what are the common themes of questions we get that we can cover while uh, we've got all you guys together. Um, we came up with four topics uh, that we're going to cover in just uh, uh, 25 or 30 minutes here. Uh, one of them is startability ratio coverage and axle ratio selection has to do with the torque converter and, and uh, how that differs radically from how you spec a vehicle uh, without a torque converter. Very briefly, we're going to talk about shift schedule selection. Uh, park brake auto neutral, there have been some complexities introduced recently based on some different options on how it's implemented and some changes in the way it's implemented in a Freightliner truck. And then finally, we'll walk through uh, Allison Optimized and Spec Pro and what, from my perspective, is a not so intuitive step that you need to take to make sure you have access to the Op Allison Optimized package and the incentives that go along with it. 
So with that, um, on the, the ratio coverage and axle ratio selection question, a lot of times we get calls on this after the fact, which is, is unfortunate, but customer that is, has a lot of uh, experience and history with a manual transmission. They know what axle ratios they ran with a the manual. They know what first gear ratio, what overdrive or, or top gear ratio they had. They look at the Allison compare ratios, and especially when it gets to first gear, they look at it and they can't believe that they would be able to do with five speeds or six speeds instead of 10 or more. And looking at the first gear ratio, their concern is they're gonna have a truck that won't get out of its own way because of the, the looking at the ratio coverage. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do, the, these same customers, uh, we bring them in here and do what you're gonna do this afternoon, take them over to the test track, they get a 70,000 pound truck, drive it halfway up the hill, stop, and then restart and climb up over that hill with no problem. Doing the same thing in a fully loaded truck with a manual transmission, there would be smoke and parts rolling out from underneath the thing. So they're in awe of how that, and they don't understand uh, how it works. But the difference is the torque converter. Bruce talked about the two to one ratio uh, multiplication at stall, but there's another feature of the way the torque converter works that is equally important. So we're gonna talk about that. You can't just look at first gear versus first gear. And obviously the correct axle ratio has a lot of Im implications. There, there is no free lunch. There is always a trade-off. You wanna get the engine speed as low as you can at cruise for fuel economy. But if you go too far, you end up a truck that doesn't perform on the low end. So to kind of set the stage with a couple of simplistic examples, with a manual transmission, top gear direct driver one to one, first gear 10 to one, and in this example, an axle ratio of four to one. If you look at the overall ratio coverage that gives you, 10 to one first gear, four to one in the uh, rear axle, 40 times the torque available at the rear axle versus what's coming out of the engine. In top gear, no torque multiplication in the transmission because you're direct drive, you still have the four to one in the rear axle, so a four to one ratio um, at the rear axle. The overall ratio in first gear or the 40 times multiplication is what you need to get the load rolling, the grunt, to get you out of the hole. In top gear, the overall ratio uh, is what determines where your engine speed is going to be at cruise. Pretty elementary, right? So now let's look at an overdrive. Still a manual transmission. We've traded the top gear of direct drive for an overdrive of 0.8 to 1. Our first gear ratio is 8 to 1. Look at the overall ratio coverage, first gear eight to one. Now we've changed the rear axle in order to get the same engine RPM at cruise. You go to a five to one in the rear axle. Top gear is 0.8, five to one in the rear axle. So the overall ratio coverage in both of these transmissions is identical. These trucks would perform identically. Just illustrates the importance of two transmissions with radically different ratios. You can make them operate the same with a change in the axle ratio. But now let's look at the same thing with a manual versus an automatic with a torque converter. The ratios on these transmissions are out of transmissions available in Spec Pro. Top gear, 0.73 to one. The ratio coverage of 16.7 will give you, you'll see on the next slide, a first gear ratio of 12.19. Our rear axle ratio in this example is 383. So if we wanted to take customer out of that truck, running manuals, put him into an automatic, look at what, ratio, what uh, rear axle ratio to use. First thing we look at is, well, let's see what it would look like with the ratio that gives him the same engine RPM at cruise. In this example, we're gonna use a 4000 HS, which is a close ratio transmission. Top gear, overdrive, 0 0.64 to one versus the 0.73. So we had to go to a 438 rear axle. That gives you the same engine RPM at cruise. Now let's look at what it does with the torque for the low end. Again, that ratio coverage of 16.7 gives you a first gear ratio is 12.19 on the manual. We've got our 383 rear axle, so 46 to 47 times the torque at the rear axle versus what the engine's putting out. With the automatic, You've got the torque converter, we've got the two to one stall ratio, so we multiply it by two. First gear is only three and a half to one compared to 1219, but we made our adjustment of 438 
in the rear axle to get the RPM adjusted. So we've got 30 times, 31 times the torque available at the rear axle. So which one of these is going to have the advantage in terms of the torque available to launch the load? The manual. So usually everybody's afraid to insult the guests, so they say automatic here. The manual is what it would look like here. But what you're not considering is one of the key advantages of the torque converter, not just in the ratio coverage, but in the way it works. The difference in a torque converter, the torque converter has what we call a, a stall speed. And all of the torque converters are matched to the engines. But typically they'd be in this 14 to 1700 RPM range. So that means that as soon as you put your foot on the throttle to get the load rolling, the engine immediately goes up to a speed that's at or near the peak torque of the engine. Compare that to with a manual transmission, Eaton says, Correct gear will allow you to start with your foot off the throttle. So you need to get the load rolling essentially at idle speed. Caterpillar says no throttle at start. Motor Truck Engineering Handbook says launch the engine with 800 RPM max. All of the diesel engines have this engagement torque spec that's used for transmission uh, for analysis on uh, manually equipped transmissions. Uh, AMTs are essentially the same range. Usually it's in the 650 to 800 RPM range. So what does that mean? Uh, this is a brochure right off the internet. It happens to be the Volvo engine D13, the DD13, D, uh, the Detroit diesel, Cummins. All of the diesel engines essentially would be the same in terms of advertising some kind of start engagement torque. In this case, it's a 1,350 foot-pound engine. The start engagement torque for a manual or an AMT, 850 foot-pounds at 800 RPMs. With a torque converter, on the other hand, our start torque would be at peak torque of the engine, so 1,350 RPM. So now let's do that math again. The manual, 850 RPM to launch, times one, 1219 rear axle, 383, or excuse me, 1219 first gear, 383 rear axle, so we got about 40,000 foot-pounds of torque available at the axle. With the automatic being able to launch at peak torque of the engine, 1,350 coming in, two times multiplication in the torque converter. So now who has the advantage? Come on, you were ready to insult me. Who has the advantage? Thank you, okay. 5% more, okay. Now this is, this is looking at a 1,350 foot-pound engine. So relatively low rated engine. The bigger you go, the bigger the gap. If you take that same engine, now you go to a 1,650 foot-pound rating, Nothing changes, the manuals are still starting at or near idle. Now you've got 1,650 to start with, so the gap grows. Okay, you begin to see how you can get a 70,000 pound load rolling on a 25% grade with a torque converter versus a manual transmission with a clutch. Now, typically in those applications that are gonna see that kind of thing where the startability is really gonna be critical is you know, a dump truck, a refuse packer, a concrete mixer, something where you're gonna use a close, or excuse me, a wide ratio transmission instead of close ratio. So now instead of the three and a half to one that we had on the close ratio, let's go to a 4500 RDS wide ratio with a 4.7 to one first gear and look at the same thing. Nothing's changed on the manual. We've got the 1,650 foot-pound engine. We got 4.7 first gear now instead of three and a half to one. So the gap, again, keeps getting higher. And again, this is something that uh, needs to be considered as the uh, axle ratio and the overall vehicle spec is considered because what it does is gives you flexibility. But one of the things you might say is, okay, but once you get the load rolling, you got more gear, shorter steps, <coughs> the manual's gonna have the advantage. But the reality is you still have the power interrupts, you still have the inefficiencies of losing turbo boost, having to recover the lost momentum during the shifts. Zero to 20 miles per hour, a manual transmission might make five, six, seven shifts, getting a fully loaded truck going up to 20 miles per hour, that time when, when the uh, 4500 RDS with a torque converter would still would be in, in uh, torque converter phase. We keep the engine up there at the peak torque the entire time, always have torque to the rear wheels to keep the load rolling. 
So what it gives you, though, is flexibility in terms of ratio coverage. If we look at that same chart we just looked at, 71% more torque available. Now, you know, we spec it so that we had the same engine RPM at cruise, but we got all this torque to start the load. Let's look at uh, making an adjustment so that we got lower engine RPM at cruise, better fuel economy, while at the same time having more torque available. So if we go from 438 to a 411, nothing's changed there. We've lost some torque in terms of launching the load, but still more than we probably need. We, can, uh, we got 61% more torque available to launch the load, but now we're running the, the engine 7% lower. So you, it gives you some flexibility in terms of setting up the vehicle spec uh, doing what you can. The Detroit diesel engines absolutely love running at those lower speeds at cruise. We've got some vehicles out there running very successfully, 1150 RPM cruise, 1100 RPM cruise, and doing a nice job, still have great startability with a torque converter for launch. There are other considerations. You can't infinitely reduce the axle ratio, uh, numerically lower axle ratio to get lower engine speed at some point, uh, you run into to issues. You have to make sure you maintain enough, you have enough power and torque to maintain your six gear at cruise. It doesn't do you any good to lower the engine speed, but then every time you hit a slight grade in the road, you end up dropping down into fifth gear. Uh, you lose whatever advantage you might have had from the lower axle ratio. But again, it gives you the flexibilities. iScan is a great tool that does the analysis, that gives you the great ability at cruise, gives you the start ability, allows you to look and understand what the trade-offs are and come up with the best spec for the customer. Okay, uh, shift schedules. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to say that there are a uh, blue million different shift schedules available. It can be as complex as you want to make it. My, recommend, my recommendation is let the engineers do their job. Uh, the Joe Johansons and the, his counterparts from Cummins and, and Detroit Diesel, along with the Freightliner truck engineering guys, for every EPA 10 engine with an Allison transmission, they've gone out there and they've done the work and they have recommended shift schedules that are in the system. And unless you ask or tell us to give you something different, you're going to get what they recommend. In most cases, you're not going to be able to do better than that. There may be some exceptions, and if you think there are, give us a call. Let's talk about it. But for the most part, this adds a lot of complexity that you guys really don't need to worry about. So my recommendation is when you get to the 343 codes, you see that long list, and there's some that say S1 primary, S5 secondary. Just don't worry about that stuff. And don't write in your own recommendation as a, as a uh, line item uh, request for the CAE group. Uh, six speed versus five speeds. For virtually any truck that's 33,000 pounds and above, you can come up with a better spec in terms of both performance and fuel economy using a six speed than you can a five speed. And we've had guys that say, well, I got a customer that's been running a five speed. He's perfectly happy with it. He likes where his engine's running at cruise. He doesn't want another overdrive. He doesn't want it to run any lower than that. Well, let's put a six speed in there, change the axle ratio so it's the same RPM at cruise. Now you've improved the performance on the low end, which not only gives them better productivity, but you get into lockup sooner, which means better fuel economy. So and again, in, in almost all cases, you, you can get a better spec with a six speed than a five speed. There, I'm sure, are exceptions. And uh, just say, if, if you think you got one, give us a call. Let's talk about it. Um, you get below 30,000 pounds, uh, you got enough engine horsepower and torque to get adequate performance. There may be an argument where a five-speed makes better sense. Um, on those lighter vehicles, there are less spin bosses in five-speed five than six-speed. Uh, but again, above, you know, in the bigger trucks, class, high class seven and class eight, <coughs> you're, you're uh, generally better off, <coughs> excuse me, you're generally better off with a six-speed. Uh, park brake auto neutral. We, we've, uh, we've got data logs, a lot of data that shows that operators, more often than you can imagine, 
with a fully automatic transmission, will pull up to the Quickie Mart, set the park brake, hop out, go get his cup of coffee, chat Lulu up, come back out a half hour later, hop in the cab, still in gear, release the parking brake and drive off. He's been sitting there idling in gear for half hour. Burns about twice as much fuel idling in gear than it would have in neutral. You don't burn a lot of fuel with no load, but in today's environment, customers will take whatever little bit of fuel economy you can give them. So the park brake auto neutral takes that out of the driver's hand, puts it in neutral, saves him whatever amount, doesn't really matter how much, just the fact that it's better uh, is something that's important. This is a relatively uh, easy thing to spec and it's becoming very close to standard. One of the complexities of the park brake auto neutral is there are several different options that are catered to the way the vehicles are operated. Uh, these two options though are, are the most common, they're, they're kind of basic. The top one is auto neutral single input. It's what was on a Freightliner truck for years. It's done with a pressure switch in the air brake circuit with a hard wire going through the transmission bulkhead connector to the transmission controller. When we see the park brakes on, we put the transmission in neutral. In order to get out of neutral, the operator had to do two things. Had to release the parking brake and select gear. If you fast forward then to today, and it's my understanding that all the multiplexed trucks with EPA 10 engines, which is most of the, the lineup of trucks you see out there on the test track, uses this bottom one, auto neutral single input with shift selector override. The differences are, instead of being hardwired, it's J1939, it's, it's multiplex. It, gets a, it just sees a message from the uh, brake controller instead of a, a pressure switch closing and sending a hardwire message. We see that message from the brake controller, command the transmission to neutral. The difference in the way it operates is now to get out of gear, even if the park brake is still on, if the operator selects a gear, it goes in, it goes to range. <clears throat> so a difference in the way it operates, even though you may spec the truck exactly the way you spec it two years ago, it may operate a little bit different, so something to be aware of. Can, it, can we fix it? Back can you old, fix it? I, I guess, uh, I, I'm not sure, the, the question is can you fix it? And well, I think the it? argument would be it's, it, 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 it isn't something that would be fixed. Can you make it work the other way? <clears throat> that from an Allison perspective, the wire will still accept that hard wire and it can be done. It would take a, a, a different calibration that didn't have the J1939 turned on for this feature and it would take adding the pressure switch in the wire. Freightliner Trucks position is that they're not gonna offer the hardwired version and <clears throat> their, their uh, argument is there are times when, when uh, you want to override this feature. In an emergency situation, you need to get the vehicle out of the way. You may want to override it if <clears throat> you lost air pressure or whatever the case may be. So they won't offer it anyway other than the J1939. Uh, everything is on the vehicle, though, if, if aftermarket bodybuilder or whatever wanted to change it. Um, the other complexity is there is some legacy that's still in some of the Compat rules in Spec Pro that... Uh, we're just uncovered recently and get into specking the uh, Allison Optimized package. Uh, the Allison Optimized packages, I think you probably all are, are at least aware of. Uh, they've been uh, part of uh, at least three different webinars. They've been part of these dealer meetings the last couple of years. Um, all of the packages include park brake auto neutral. This sheet is one of uh, at least three that are out on uh, sales center, <clears throat> but it shows the rules, if you will, of the Allison Optimize, what vehicles, what uh, vocational segments, truck models, and transmissions apply. Uh, gives the retail discounts, which are pretty significant, pretty uh, aggressive, $800 to $5,600 retail. If there are any A84 vocational segment restrictions, they're listed here. If there are any AA3 body type restrictions, they're listed here. And then the different uh, codes, depending on whether you want a five speed or a six speed. So all of that's out on Sales Center. The complexity comes in when you go to Spec and Inspect Pro, and this slide is right from uh, Brian Daniels' 
uh, webinar three or four weeks ago, Brian Daniels and Greg Trinan uh, used this slide. The first three steps are pretty intuitive. Off of that sheet that describes the program and the restrictions, if you select an A84 uh, vocational segment, an A3 body type that qualify, and a transmission that's included in whatever chassis that you're specking, everything's pretty simple at that point. Then you get into this next section, which is not so intuitive. It has to do with the legacy of the hardwired auto neutral. There is still a compat rule that requires that if you have a, uh, if you want a 343 code with auto neutral, you have to bring in this 882 module, which uh, I believe the description is something like uh, two valve park brake with auto neutral. But essentially it's the pressure switch and wire that you needed on the old hardwired version. So you have to pull in that 882018 or 021 and then you have to go to the uh, 34C module, which is the transmission bulkhead connector, and select the 34C001, 2, or 3, depending on the location of that bulkhead connector. You don't use those with the J1939 implementation, but it's still a legacy that they're working to correct until that's done. You got to do this if you're going to get the uh, access to the Allison optimized packages. So just walking through it quickly, uh, the A84 codes, this example is a 4500 RDS non-muni dump in an M2112. The A84 restrictions are construction and uh, road and highway maintenance. AA3, uh, end dump ver and uh, front plow with an end dump. Transmission is a 4500 RDS. Then you get into the not so intuitive part. The 882 module, one valve park brake system with dash control valve, auto neutral and wiring indicator, or two park brake system, same thing. Got to have one of those two, and you have to select one of those three 34C codes, 0012 or 3. It, once you've done that, when you go to the 343 section, you'll have access to the 343 codes with the Allison Optimize package. Select one of those you'll get the discount, you'll also get the additional coverage, five years on everything except 3,000 and 4,000 HS in a tractor, in which case you get seven year coverage. Questions? You're great, either you already knew that and you've been... No, thank you for clearing <clears throat> Well, and, and I'll tell you, it, it's... Uh, it, uh, I was pulling my hair out trying to understand it. And where this kind of got uncovered was uh, uh, the guys in marketing ran a query of uh, all the vehicles spec this year with Allison transmissions, both built and in backlog, looked at the spec, comparing it to the sheet that shows the different uh, restrictions, the A84 and, and A3 and, and, and I.O. package restrictions. Um, and looked at, okay, out of all these trucks, how many of them that appear to qualify, that appear to meet all the requirements or restrictions in the Allison Optimize program, how many actually had the Allison Optimize uh, code selected and therefore got the discount and the extended coverage? And it was around 20%. Part of it is they get in there and they don't see it because of this, this quirk that uh, you guys now know and understand, and uh, I think in the past a lot of guys haven't. So hopefully it's helpful. Hopefully it gets corrected uh, very quickly. So any other questions? How come we haven't talked about the seven speed? Why haven't we talked about the seven speed? <clears throat> You're talking about the 4,000, uh, the 4,700 specifically, and the reason, frankly, is that <clears throat> the seven speed is not released in a Freightliner truck. Uh, I understand that there is an uh, active program or, or uh, uh, PAR in the system to put the 4700 in the Coronado SD. Um, I've heard late this year, but I don't know that there is a date uh, that's been announced. Uh, you'd have to ask the, the product strategy guys that, but I think there is a plan. There, there's, it's recognized that there is demand. Uh, customers have asked for it, but today the 4700 is not, not released in the Freightliner. But it is in the Star. It is in the Western Star. That's uh, correct. Question for 
It's a great concrete transmission. Comment was it's a great concrete transmission. Great transmission. I'll repeat that again for the video. It's a great concrete truck transmission. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, the uh, automated manual people have criticized Allison's post performance. Like when we're talking about highway fuel mileage, one of the arguments that they're making is just that when you coast down a hill with an eight speed uh, type transmission, then you would be, you know, you would not be uh, losing any of your accumulated road speed and momentum from the hill. Whereas the Allison, because it turns backwards into the converter and it drags it, how would you answer that question? Well, I, I, I'm going to repeat your question. You said that the uh, the AMT folks have criticized the Allison because uh, coasting down a hill, the torque converter turns backwards. Um, I guess, first of all, I don't believe they understand the physics of a torque converter because nothing turns backwards. And when you're cruising down the speed, anytime, uh, as Bruce went through earlier, the torque converter is in its fluid coupling torque multiplication mode. When you launch, depending on the load uh, and the speed, you'll usually make a first to second, one to two shift, and then sometime in second gear it'll shift into lockup. From that point on, it's a mechanical co-link. There, 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 it, it is the same as having a clutch applied up there. In fact, that's exactly what it is. So mechanically and physically, it's, it's a mechanical link to the engine. It's direct drive. Uh, it depends on the, the speed at which it locks up, the torque converter locks up, depends on the axle ratio, the load, uh, but uh, typically, certainly below 20 mile per hour, and typically below 15 mile per hour, but at highway speeds, always, the torque converter is going to be locked up, and it's a direct mechanical link, no but, so there is no difference, no. Yeah. So I, I'd like to have that debate with them, but don't know where they're coming from. He said lockup only occurs. I thought lockup started on four, five, and six. No. Uh, the, I think your question is second and third lockup comes on versus four, five, and six. Now we, you know, the, we want to get lockup on as soon as. You have enough tractive effort to keep the load accelerating without the benefit of the torque multiplication. We need that torque multiplication to get the load rolling. That's how we do with fewer number of gears than, than a manual. But once you get it rolling and we can handle with mechanical ratios the steps to, to keep the speed increasing, we lock it up as soon as we can. So you can lock up third, second, or third. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Driving them you don't notice it because well, between the shifts, the engine oil <coughs> hardly changes. When, uh, once the torque converter does lock up, it never comes off. It doesn't come off in between the shifts. It stays on all the way up through six gear and back down. We don't interrupt lock up to make a shift, for example. Uh, once it comes on, it stays on. Okay. But fourth is, a, is always lock up. Fourth is always direct drive, one to one ratio. But the and yes, it's always in lock up in fourth. But it can lock it can and does lock up in second and third. Driving it, it doesn't always well, lock up in second. Well, yeah, I think your comment is you don't. It's yeah. driving it. It isn't. It isn't obvious when lockup comes on and off. Lockup it is feels. Fifty-six. I can tell it, but I can't tell it second and third. Yeah. Well, when it comes up, the lockup shift typically feels like any other shift except where you might drop three hundred RPM on a range shift. It'll only drop one hundred fifty RPM or so. Uh, so, yeah, maybe uh, when you're out there on a test track, play around a little bit. And, uh, but it isn't, it isn't, I mean, it doesn't feel any different to the guy driving a truck than any other shift, really. Competition-wise, have you been able to dissect the Caterpillar CX-31? And uh, the question is, have we been able to dissect the CX-31? And, and uh, you know, that product's been around uh, for a long time uh, in off-highway applications. Uh, they made a run at it on the on highway. Um, I think it's fair to say we got a pretty good idea what's inside that box. Um, we think we got a good product that can uh, run up against it anywhere they put it. Um, and it looks like we're going to get the opportunity to prove that uh, in, in some additional applications here in the pretty near future. <laughs>